So last Sunday night, we saw one of the turning points of the gospel of Jesus Christ and its spread in the world. And one of the turning points of the early churches and their progress with the gospel. And frankly, one of the turning points of the history of New Testament Christianity. Because Jesus personally confronted, blinded, and converted Saul of Tarsus, we have, as one preacher put it, a changed man from a volatile, energetic, dynamic enemy of Jesus Christ came the greater part of the New Testament, came the noblest statements of Christian theology, came the sweetest songs of God's love, and he became the most saintly, heroic, person who ever named the name of Jesus Christ. What a transformation. And what a transformation it was when Saul believed the gospel. And we believe if Jesus could open Saul's eyes, he can open anyone's eyes. If Jesus could get his attention, he can get anyone's attention. If Jesus could save Saul, he can save you. He can, and I pray he has, and your life has been transformed. Did not only did Jesus change, radically change life for this one man, life became different for Jesus' churches too. At least for a pause, at least to give them a break from the dangerous persecution, from the troubling times, from the valley of the shadow that they walked. So here in Acts chapter 9, Saul had been converted and baptized, and a disciple had been sent to him, Ananias. And here we will see the people Saul had hated, Loving him, well, learning to love him at least. So if you'd pick up and look with me, Acts chapter 9 and verse 17. Acts 9 and verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed, that means he attempted, he was just trying it out, to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles the leaders of the disciples, and they declared unto them, he declared unto them how he, Saul, had seen the Lord in the way, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how Saul had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And that made a difference. He was with them, coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Which, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea. Now, recall who, who landed in Caesarea at the end of Acts chapter 8. A form, a, well, not a former, a deacon, Philip, who was a friend of Stephen's. Fellow deacon. And so they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. And note what verse 31 says. Then have the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified, strengthened, built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. One of the early church's greatest enemies repented. The name of Jesus Christ was exalted more and more. Disciples of Jesus were called upon to love people they probably didn't expect they'd love ever. 
When it was all said and done, the churches rested and were established and multiplied. A chapter of suffering came to a close. It stopped storming out. The wind died down. The rain ceased. The lightning quit. Peace. Be still. What happened was the dust settled for hurting disciples and hurting churches. So our message tonight is this, how the dust settled for hurting disciples. How the dust settled for hurting disciples. Let's go ahead and ask God to help us one more time before we get into the message tonight. Father, would you comfort your people by your spirit? Thank you that Jesus promised the Holy Ghost, the comforter, and you have given him to us. And he inspired these words, the recounting of these historical events. But God, these were workings of God among men, things that you did among men. God, we sure need you to work among us. We need you. We need your comfort. We need your help. We need us to settle. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that phrase, uh, let the dust settle, I was in the midst of the raw emotions and heartache of April, and a friend of mine was in the midst of renovating a room for a new nursery and welcoming a son into the world. And we wanted and still want to, in fact, I texted him the other day, want to get together for coffee and conversation about all the interesting and meaningful things of life. So I said, let the dust settle and then we'll get together. And you pray it happens, I'm praying it does soon. But that phrase, we often use it to mean when life is less busy, um, but life doesn't always slow down. When life is less crazy, but life has a way of throwing knuckleballs. When life is less heavy, but life has its load to bear. Let the dust settle. And actual dust can agitate allergies. For those of you interested in that fact, some of you are like, you don't need to remind me of that. And pollen season in Georgia, which has passed uh, for the most part, no. <laughs> the pollen dust, it comes and it affects everything once a year and it blows through and it serves a purpose even if you don't believe there's a purpose to it and then it is gone and you just got to let the dust settle. For hurting disciples, the dust is not guaranteed to settle in this life of following Jesus. Paul said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Peter said, think it not strange, the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation." Storms come, dust gets stirred up, cold seasons blow in, hurts happen. And we as followers of Jesus cannot expect a life without pain, heartache, and loss. We cannot expect that everything will clear up in this life every time it gets dusty. We cannot avoid taking steps forward in the midst of difficulty. If we did, we'd not make much progress toward the perfect, pain-free, sin-free kingdom of God because, as Paul said, through much tribulation, we must enter therein. Through much, tribu through much tribulation. And all that being said, Jesus graciously allows us to see some dust settle in our lives. He gets us to the eye of the storm and then on the way to the end of the storm. And he meets us halfway across the parched desert with a refreshing glass of cool water. He mends a broken heart, a wounded soul, a hurting disciple. And we as his church can rest. And we can be edified. And we can be multiplied. And we can be directed by this very Spirit of God who fashioned the earth which was dark and without form and empty. Who remembers that? 
in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and it says that the earth was dark and it was shapeless and it was empty and yet the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The point is this, you as a disciple and we as a church may have times in our lives where we feel dark and we feel without form and we feel empty and yet the Spirit moves upon our waters. A comforter has come. We can be comforted deeply in our very soul. We can be comforted daily as we need it, practically. We can overcome our fears, our fears of evil men, our fears of failure, our fears of not having what we need for life, our fears of people walking away, our fears of people causing problems. Our fears of finances not being there. Our fears of not moving ahead. Hurting disciples, we will hurt. Life will be dusty. Yet God Himself can settle the dust and help us learn to trust. He can give us rest and He can build us up and He can multiply disciples and churches. He can do it. He's done it before. The God of March is the God of April. And the God of April is the God of May. And the God of 2022 is the God of Acts chapter 9. He's a gracious God who has not left us nor forsaken us, and He can and will settle the dust. And if only it's for a season, the day is coming when all dust will be forever settled. So we ask Him tonight, Father, how did the dust settle for your son's hurting disciples. How did it settle? Let's start here. The dust settled for hurting disciples after they helped someone who hurt them. The dust settled for hurting disciples after they helped someone who hurt them. Saul, at the beginning of chapter 9, was en route to arrest disciples in Damascus. And by Acts chapter 9 and verse 17 through 19, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias who helped Saul receive his sight, baptized him, fed him, and introduced him to the very disciples he went there to hurt. And they were afraid of him, yet God changed that as they obeyed God. Then he began to preach the name he was ready to destroy, and so much so that the Jews of Damascus wanted to destroy him. Then the disciples he, said he had sought to hurt helped him to escape by night over the city wall in a basket. And if the disciples of Damascus hadn't helped the one who had set out to hurt them, he would have been on his own. But he wasn't because they helped him. And then he returned to Jerusalem, where he really hurt disciples. I mean, he really hurt them there. He stood by as men stoned Stephen to death. And he gave his voice against men and women disciples in trials of blasphemy in the synagogue so they would face the same fate. And in his own words, he was exceedingly mad against them. Yet he was now one of them, even if they didn't know it yet. In Acts chapter 8, verse 3, he made havoc of the church at Jerusalem. But in Acts chapter 9, look at the beginning of verse 26. It says, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. That word essayed means he's, he tried it out to see if it would work, and he wasn't sure yet what would happen. He, know, he knew who he was when he left Jerusalem. He knew the wake he had left behind there, and so he wasn't sure what would happen, and, but he wanted to join himself to them. That means he wanted to, that word means to glue together, to fasten, to cleave to, to join oneself to. I mean, you can admire this new disciple with a past. He knew who he needed in his life. He knew who he needed in his life. I need my Lord's people. I need his followers. I'm a loner without other disciples. And listen, dear people, if you're a disciple, you need other disciples too. You're a loner without the church. You need to join yourselves to them in every way. In every way, your life, make it a part of theirs. But when he tried to join them, they were afraid of him. All of them were, it says in verse 26. Nobody believed he was a disciple. Maybe they thought this is a trick, this is a trap. 
Their caution was prudent. It was wise. It made sense. But one of the disciples who was well known among them for his sacrifice and his integrity and his comfort of others, Barnabas, the son of consolation, the son of comfort, he got a hold of this child, or I'm sorry, this child, this church reject, and he brought him to the church leaders, the apostles, and he declared what happened to him. He told him, listen, Saul shared with me that he saw Jesus, and Jesus spoke to him, and there's, there's testimony that he was preaching in the name of Jesus in the, Damascus, and he was preaching boldly, and that seems to be all it took for Saul to be with the disciples and apostles. You look at verse 28 of chapter 9, it says he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And that was also all it took to get him back to his old crowd. If you look in verse 29, the Grecians were the Hellenistic culture Jews. They were the Jews who weren't as culturally oriented towards Jerusalem and speaking the Hebrew language. They would have been more so the cultured ones, the liberals of the Jews that were cultured by, by Greece and the, to, the prevail, prevailing things of the culture outside of Israel. And that Saul was Saul of Tarsus, a city of Cilicia. So he was, a, he was a dogmatic Pharisee, and yet he was very well cultured. And he went back to the people. It was his old running buddies, in a sense, the Grecians. And yet he had a new message, and he was bold enough with that message they wanted to kill him. When his new brothers knew about it, they got him out of there. They got him to Caesarea. They're protecting the one who hurt them. And they got him to Caesarea. And again, we're reminded who was in Caesarea but Philip. Saul had stoned Stephen, one of his brothers. Or he had been there when Stephen was stoned to death. And from Caesarea, they sent Saul to his hometown of Tarsus. What's the point? The dust settled for hurting disciples after they helped the one that hurt them. They got their hands on him to help him. I've asked a few men for help if you'd come at this time. I want you to see this. This young man is going to represent Saul, so he's going to stand over here. These two young men will stand over here if you would. So we're going to be, first, the disciples in Damascus. And so here's a man who's coming to persecute us and to lay hold of us and drag us to Jerusalem so that we could be tried and so that we could possibly be killed. He's converted, right? I'm Ananias in Damascus. And God gets my attention and says, Hey, I want you to go to him and lay your hands on him. I want your touch of my grace to be in his life. And in times it's like, I don't know about this. Jesus said, go. So we went. And he remember what, what we read. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul. And what did he do? He brought him to the disciples. And then when the Jews wanted to kill him, these very disciples whom he had sought to hurt helped him escape. And so then he goes back to Jerusalem. Same story, or same idea, different town. Here's the disciples of Jerusalem. The disciples at Damascus, all all they had to worry about were their fears of this man. The disciples at Jerusalem had their fears, but also harsh realities that this man had inflicted upon their life. And yet he comes back, They're all scared of him. And the son of consolation, blessed old Barnabas. Boy, did did he not know what this guy would mean in his life, huh? Blessed old Barnabas, he goes and he hears him out. Let's go have uh, some fish and some coffee. (laughs) And he hears him out and Saul tells him, his testimony, and what Christ did in his life, and how he boldly preached in the name of Jesus. So he's like, Barnabas, it says, what does it say? It says he took him, and he brought him to the apostles, and he told them what was going on, and suddenly he is with them. And then when Grecians in Jerusalem are gunning for his life, for preaching the name he once tried to destroy, they're helping him escape. 
They are helping the very one that hurt them deeply. They're helping him. All because, come over here one more time. All because one disciple in Damascus, then one disciple in Jerusalem said, I will build a bridge and lay my hand upon this one who has come to know Jesus and I will lay my hand upon his people and I will bring them together. That's what he did. Stay close. You can have a seat. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me use you in just a minute. If you, if you do not seek to have a heart of help for those who have hurt you, the dust may never settle. The dust may never settle. If we don't seek to have a heart that wants to help those who have hurt us, the dust may never settle. Things in America aren't going to get any better. What we are, the pain we're experiencing is normal, as normal as the sun coming up in the morning for our brothers and sisters on the other, other side of the world, where they don't have good legal systems. And if we do not seek to help those who have hurt us to build a bridge from where they are to who they need, the dust will not settle. You say, well, where, where do you get this from? Can you picture your Savior on the cross with his arms stretched open wide, suspended between heaven and earth, praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Jesus instructed us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. But if we will not forgive men their trespasses, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us. There will be a roadblock in between us and our Father, who we're always secure in that relationship. We are on our way to heaven, but there will be a roadblock in our relationship if we do not forgive. If we do not forgive. There is life to be lived after tragedies. There is clarity to be gained when dust settles and acted upon. So if hurting disciples, once they help those who hurt them, find the dust settling, then what do they do when the dust settles? What did these disciples do when the dust settled? And I want you to notice this, that hurting disciples, they walked with the one who was with them before the dust, through the dust, and after the dust settled. They walked with the one who was with them before the dust came, who was with them through the dust, and after the dust. And the Lord was obviously, you read Acts, the Lord was obviously and powerfully with the church before Stephen's death and before Saul's persecution and before these believers were scattered throughout the region of Israel, throughout that land. And yet he was obviously with them through the dust as Philip went and preached the gospel to the Samaritans and the multitude believed the gospel in Samaria. And when Philip saw one man believe the gospel in the desert and when their enemy's eyes were opened and he was brought to their doorstep as a converted disciple, so if Jesus was with them before the dust and through the dust and he worked to make the dust settle, then why not walk with him when the dust settles? Think about this. Who was it who told his disciples, you'll be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria? He didn't say how that would happen. He said, you will be witnesses of me in this area. Who was it that filled Stephen to preach a message that would get him killed? Who was it whose name and message spread to other places throughout Judea and Samaria as he said it would and even through dusty times? Who was it that gave those new churches rest? Who really started those churches and built them? And if you can think about our life, church, we serve a risen Christ who has been the head of Emmanuel Baptist Church ever since its inception 60 years ago. Who was it that sent a missionary of 30 plus years from France to the United States to hold a battered church together? 
Who was it who used that preacher in that church to bring a wandering disciple back to the Lord and all in commitment to him? Who was it? Who was it who allowed that disciple to open a gun range whose prophets would help support the very church ministry that salvaged the life of his family? That's why that place was opened up. Who was it that allowed that? And who was it that allowed this dust storm to shake up our lives? Listen, if Jesus was with us before the dust, and if Jesus is with us through the dust, let's walk with him when the dust settles. You say, how do we do that? What did the disciples walk in when the dust settled? Look at verse 31. It said they walked in the fear of the Lord. They walked in the fear of the Lord. And I would suggest this, you go back to, I would start here, you go back to Acts chapter 2, and you see that when God did what He did, the Spirit of God did what He did, the people were in awe. I mean, they, they were in awe of what God was doing. In other words, they, in, the, in the good times, in the bad times, they, they, they didn't turn away from God. They said, God, what are you doing? Whatever you're doing, we want to be on board with what you're doing. We may not understand everything. These things may not be in our power, but we fear you. Fearing the Lord is obeying Jesus. You go to the Old Testament and you'll find fearing the Lord is keeping His commands. It's walking in His ways. It's loving Him. It's serving Him with all your heart and all your soul. It's reading Scripture so you can obey Scripture with a humble heart and a steadfast hand. It's serving God sincerely and truly. And church isn't a game. And gospel witness isn't a game. Putting away all else to serve Him. The Old Testament Scriptures would tell us the secret of the Lord is with disciples who fear Him. His eye is on those who fear Him. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins, Proverbs tell us. It's where knowledge begins. It's where pride and arrogance and evil ways and wicked words end. Disciples who walk in the fear of the Lord are multiplied. They're multiplied. They thrive. They're strong. They're satisfied. They don't need luxury and wealth and the trouble that comes with it. For better is the little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. They don't need the riches of this world because they have God. When the dust settles, our feet better be planted on the way of the fear of the Lord. We better be walking His way. Our ministry better be biblical. Our finances must be built on His principles and His truths. We all walk, walk in the fear of the Lord. You say, well, what else did the disciples do when the dust settled? Look back at verse 31. It says they were walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. I want you to see what this means for yourself. Go, go take your Bible, turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. What does it mean to walk in the comfort of the Holy Ghost? Now, John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you have a lot of amazing teaching that Jesus give, gave. And if you will remember, it's in his darkest hours, his last hours with his disciples. And he's, he was giving his disciples these things before he would be betrayed and delivered into the hands of men and, be, and suffer many things at their hands and be crucified. He prepared them for what was to come. And they would need comfort. You see throughout these verses words like, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be discouraged. You'll you'll see that. So look at John chapter 13. What did he say to them in those moments? Verse 34 says, He told them a new commandment I gave unto you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So that's his command. Look at verse 15 of chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love Jesus, love his followers, and I will pray the Father. He shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. The world can't receive him. They don't see him or they don't know him, but you know the Spirit, because he dwelleth with you. He shall be in you. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Verse 21, he said, He that hath my commandments 
and keepeth them. He that knows he is to love other disciples and he does it. He it is that loves Jesus. And he that loves Jesus will be loved to Jesus' Father. And Jesus will love him. And Jesus will manifest himself to him. Look at chapter 15 and verse 9. Jesus said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. My joy, even though I'm going to be crucified. My joy, even though that the world, and the rest of the chapter 15, even though the world's going to hate you, my joy might remain in you. And your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Look at chapter 16 and verse 33. He said, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So as these disciples abided in Jesus' commandments and loved one another, and stayed together, and prayed together, they would find joy, and they would find comfort, and they would find peace in Jesus, and His commands that they would not find in the world, because they would only find trouble in the world, but in Jesus and in His followers, they would find comfort in the Holy Ghost. And can I ask, what did the disciples do in Acts, but what Jesus said to do in the face of dusty times? Yes, they were scattered throughout those regions, but those disciples stayed together. Wherever they went, they got together. They joined themselves together. They gathered as those churches. They grew as those disciples. Yes, they went with that gospel. They obeyed Jesus and loved each other, and they had comfort that did not go away. The dust can settle at Emmanuel Baptist Church, but the question is, when the dust settles, will we be found walking with Jesus and His church and His ways, or will we be walking our own way? If you want to rest and be edified and be multiplied, you've got to walk with our shepherd and His flock. Men, come here, men. Come here again. So the dust settled. Remember, the dust settled... When hurting disciples help those who hurt them. And when the dust settles, come on. I know this might seem weird, but we're going to link up arms. Come on. Pretend I have a Bible in my hand. Because when the dust settles, you know how the churches are multiplied? You know how disciples are made? You know how churches move forward? It's when disciples stay together. And they stay as one. And no matter what's behind them, they keep... This is going to be interesting. They're going to keep walking forward. They're going to walk forward. Now back up. Don't trip. They're going to walk forward. Okay, link arms with him. They're going to walk forward in the fear of the Lord. That means they're not walking their own way. They don't have to guess about the future. They don't have to be anxious about the future. They have a Father in heaven that they can go to and seek Him. And as long as they stay together, and as long as they love one another, when they come together and they pray, their Father's going to answer their prayer. And He's going to daily meet their needs. Give us this day our daily bread. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to fill them with joy and peace and comfort that would shake the world and make them want to leave Jerusalem and go around the world with the gospel. We will walk in the fear of God. That means we will know the book and everything about Emmanuel Baptist Church will be governed by that book. That's walking in the fear of the Lord. That's how we will be multiplied. That's how we'll go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature and make disciples of all nations and generations. We will walk in the fear of the Lord. But notice as we walk in the fear of the Lord and obey Jesus, you know what that does? It comforts us. Because you have a lot more comfort, Colin, break off a minute. You have a lot more comfort when you're connected with them than you are by yourself. Don't let that be you. Jesus intended for the comfort of the Holy Ghost to be found right here. Right here. So let me ask you, when the dust settles, where will you be? Where will you be? Listen, I was reading in Revelation, and there are some very terrible things coming upon the world. The world of the ungodly, the world of those who do not believe in God, the world of those who have rejected the gospel, rejected Christ, but we are secure forever in our Father. When the dust settles, ultimately, we're good. 
Why, why in our lifetime, why would we not just choose to live by faith and just choose to have the rest and peace we're going to have forever? Why would we be like Lot? Why would we put our interests and our eggs in the basket of the world when we know that basket's going to be toppled and all those eggs are going to be broken and cracked? Why would we do that? No, come on. We won't do that. We will stay together. And we will walk in the fear of the Lord. And we will walk in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. You say, well, what if, what if, what if, what if a brother or sister in Christ is not doing this? Love them where they are and pray they do this. You can't force someone to do this. And you better not try. Don't do it. I'm called as a pastor to be meek and easy to be entreated and gentle. And you're called as a flock to look like Christ. You pray for people, love them where they are, meet them where they are. But as we are here, we walk forward together.